the leaders and legends. As Sally said, this is the, the last for the calendar year, not the academic year. Um, <clears throat> now, a special thanks to my good friend, Frank Bush. I do not know what we would have done without Frank's help, not only in this particular instance where we have managed to get it's the once the most <clears throat> profoundly respectful individual, a respected business leader, but on other many occasions, Frank, our gratitude to you. <clears throat> I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, Anne McLaughlin Corologos. Anne has done a remarkable job serving our country in a number of roles and with great distinction. In the 1980s, Anne served in a variety of important roles for the U.S. government, including Assistant Secretary of the Department of Treasury, where she earned the department's highest honor and the Alexander Hamilton Award for Distinguished Leadership. And Under Secretary of the Department of the Interior, but it did not end there. Her expertise was in high demand. In 1987, President Ronald Reagan appointed her to lead the Department of Labor. As secretary, <clears throat> Anne focused public and private sector attention on the needs of a rapidly changing international and national workplace and work workforce, tackling issues as diverse as child and other dependent care, worker shortages, skill gaps, and older workers. For this work, Anne received the President's Citizen Medal. But that's only part of the story. In 1990s, Anne took her experience to the corporate world, becoming an active board member of a number of organizations, among them American Airlines, Kellogg Company, and Marriott Hotels. In addition, Anne has served with distinction as the president of the Aspen Institute on the board of Dana Foundation and recently completed her term as the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Global Policy Think Tank, the Rand Corporation. It is our privilege that today we can benefit from Anne's ex extraordinary breadth of experience and accomplishments in the <clears throat> government, business, and not-for-profit sectors as she shares with us some of the thoughts on the revol evolving issues of corporate governance. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you Anne Corologos. I was starting to sit back and just enjoy that introduction. <laughs> thank you, uh, Dean Gupta. And uh, I, too, want to thank Frank Birch for suggesting uh, that I visit Cary Business School. Uh, we had a great dinner last night with the dean and some others and learned a lot about the vision of the school, it's quite exciting. I'm a, a Wharton dropout, and I'm not sure everyone understands that story. I'll share it with you for a minute. I, uh, after I was at the Interior Department, I decided it would be nice if I could uh, get a MBA degree, something I've always been a believer, by the way, in continuing education. I've taken courses over time. So I got into the Wharton Executive Program. And in my second semester, and I actually was doing OK. Uh, I hadn't reached the aha moment in statistics. And uh, lo and behold, saved by the bell, I was asked to be Secretary of Labor. <laughs> well, it's even more amusing and more frightening for your taxpayer money. You may recall the Secretary of Labor has oversight over the Bureau of Labor Statistics. <laughs> but the vision for the Cary Business School is quite exciting, and I thank you for sharing that with me. I'm uh, delighted to be included in a group of leaders and legends. I have some three friends who came because they didn't know I was a legend. Uh, one drove from Washington. It sort of reminds me of Henry Kissinger. That Don't they say of Henry Kissinger? He's a legend in his own mind. So let's, <laughs> let's see if this is true here. My comments um, are uh, around corporate governance, and I have the title. Uh, we sort of co-wrote it with some of the people on the dean's staff, business heal thyself, the role of corporate governance in the 21st century organizations. And I say organizations, not just corporations, because I hope those of you who are here not in a corporation, but in any in medical school or business schools or nonprofit will derive some 
something from my remarks because I think it's applicable by and large. But I have, and particularly recently, felt that the moral failure of business leaders, and we read so much about it in these past years, um, brings the failure of capitalism and ultimately democracy, and therefore the importance of, of uh, business leaders having a good moral compass seems to me more important today than ever. Uh, the British economist Fred Hirsch in the 70s uh, talked about the undermining of moral and communal values that are the market's only essential underpinnings, and he laments that the weakening of traditional social values has made predominantly capitalist economies more difficult to manage. And I'm afraid we see in the political environment and the behavior uh, some uh, truth to that if we didn't know before. Let me ask you, uh, how many here are on a corporate board or more? Uh, one or two or one? Raise of hands. OK. How many uh, are on a public company board? OK. Not as many as I thought. How many here would like to be on a corporate board? <laughs> Okay, now, thank you, because I'd like to share with you from an article I wrote in, uh, I think it was 2006, in Directors and Boards magazine. Uh, the title was Abandon Certain Misconceptions, but I talk about uh, answering the question posed by the publication, um, how do I get on a corporate board? And I, my answer at the outset of the article is, why would you want to? And then I went on to say, why on earth would anyone of sound mind be interested in serving on a corporate board in today's anti-business, regulation-infested, overtaxed, anti-globalization, protectionist-minded, constantly investigated, negative, headline-filled governance environment? Stop and think. Regulators are telling us how much cream to put in ice cream, how to mow our grass, how to place baby seats in cars, how many raw eggs to put in a Caesar salad, how, many, um, how to drink our beer, and how many girls have to play on a basketball team. And corporate boards beholden to moody, large, and small shareholders must answer the question, why are my dividends down? At hugely public annual meetings where analysts scrutinize every utterance, and yet people are still clamoring, there's some here, to be on a corporate board. Well, I thought I'd talk a little bit then about the role of corporate boards and as I see it. Uh, and I hope I end by able to, say, uh, able to say to you, by all means, join a corporate board. But it's not without its risks. Because uh, the role of corporate boards today, women on corporate boards, the effectiveness of corporate boards, the ineffectiveness of corporate boards, corporate governance, are all keeping governments, regulators, businessmen and women, scholars, Congress, governance experts, and others busy, not only here in the US, but all over Europe as well. Uh, codes of conduct, poured governance guidelines, uh, from the SEC to the New York Stock Exchange to NASDAQ to the Business Roundtable, the Conference Board, these are all the subjects. And let me add that I was on the General Motors Board in 1990. I left in 1999, but that's a subject matter for Q&A or over a martini. But um, I say that because in 1990, corporate governance guidelines were just emerging, and GM was in the forefront. Uh, you can hold that thought when you think about GM today. The outside director is faced, uh, I think, with a great many responsibilities. The traditional one of overseeing management, of course, and guarding the shareholder interests, and the newer ones of social responsibility and accountability to non-shareholder constituents. The outside director has to take into account the interest of present shareholders, including institutional investors, hedge funds, and traders, future shareholders making sure that the company is healthy enough to ensure continuing demand for its products and services, and other stakeholders such as customers, employees, communities, suppliers, lenders, and the like. And balancing these interests is difficult, maybe the only way to handle seemingly competing pressures is to give your stockholders, as my friend Cliff Wharton many years ago said, common sense, diligence, and integrity. And that is my personal guiding light in the boards on which I serve. I'm not a financial or housing wizard when I was on the Fannie Mae board, nor an aeronautical engineer at American Airlines, 
or a master nutritionist at the Kellogg Company, or an IT geek when I served on the Microsoft board. But I pride myself on having the common sense, the diligence, the integrity to see me through board service at those and other companies. Now let me assure you, each board on which I've served or continue to serve does have fun functional expertise in these required areas, certainly financial expertise. And um, some like me bring in a complementary set of experiences and wisdom as the generalist. Uh, that's a good combination on a board. One of the most important factors, therefore, ensuring that a board functions effectively to meet all these responsibilities is having the right tone at the top. We often hear the phrase, particularly with regard to accounting, but it's th true throughout the organization. The tone at the top shapes corporate culture. It permeates the corporation's relationships with all its constituents, investors, employees, customers, suppliers, regulators, local communities, and other constituents. And the board should work with the CEO and senior management to actively cultivate a corporate culture that gives high priority to ethical standards, principles of fair dealing, professionalism, integrity, compliance, and legal requirements to ensure that the company's strategic goals are ethically sound. So in setting this kind of tone at the top, I think transparency and communication is key. What are the corporate ethics, you might say, involved in granting large increases or golden parachutes for senior management when the rest of the corporation is sacrificing? What are the corporate ethics involved in the huge growth of CEO pay, which has increased many-fold over the increases even for middle managers and professionals in the organization? Aside from whether these are all arm's length transactions, there's an ethic of example it sets and clearly a message it sends. If the American corporation wants the trust and respect it needs to compete and to stave off that heavy hand of regulation, it will have to earn it by setting an example against inordinate consumption in favor of savings and long-term thinking. It, not, it cannot really give or afford to give a greedy appearance with showy executive compensation and then turn around and ask for sacrifice. To get personal for a minute, I was uh, um, lead director. I don't know why I even say this publicly, but I'm sort of not unproud of it. I was lead director at Fannie Mae when the charges and counter charges of regulator issues started flying in 2005, 2006. As the Rudman, this was Senator Rudman, the lawyer, acting as lawyer at the time, as the Rudman report on Fannie Mae investigation put it, there was an attitude of arrogance, an absence of teamwork, and a culture that discouraged dissenting views. How much further away from the ideal can you get? These types of attitudes and behaviors are indeed an early warning. You can say, why didn't we know it? Very hard when a regulator and others are telling you how wonderful the company is when magazines say you have the best CFO, when Congress is just can't, can't do enough for you. But we had to act when we learned from the regulator there were no criminal activities as such. So we changed management, we responded to the regulators, we responded to Justice Department investigators and to the US Congress. We had to fend off media hysteria and opposition groups with personal agendas we had to deal with strong personalities on the board who have had major corporate and government resumes and at the same time do this virtually nonstop for almost two years. To make a long story, which got longer, but long story short, on this phase of Fannie Mae's life, we were able to make a restatement of our financials for the years in question, 1998 to 2002, by the time 2006 came. The Department of Justice did drop their investigation. They did not file criminal charges against the company or anyone there. Uh, we put in a new CEO, a new CFO, a new CRO, Chief Risk Officer, a new controller, a new internal auditor and staff, a new general counsel, a new COO, a new structure, including a non-executive chairman, and six new directors. Well, sadly, the company was on the right track. And through no fault of its own, it came down like Humpty Dumpty from this recent meltdown in housing, uh, not of Fannie Mae's doing, in my view. 
we can talk another time, perhaps, Dean, about social engineering through government policy. Okay, now I'm often asked, how do I view my role as an outside director? And my response is, it depends on the way, uh, in a way, on who you think I serve. Technically, the board is selected by the stockholders and is accountable to the stockholders to protect their investment and make it grow. But just who is the stockholder for these purposes? That is a more complicated question, especially today. Some, of course, are long-term investors who intend to stick with the company no matter what. Some are investors trying to maximize returns as quickly as possible and are placing incredible pressure for short-term results. So how should an outside director then discharge his or her responsibilities? Well, there are the traditionalists who believe that the board exists primarily to hire management and when necessary to fire it. They argue this keeps boards from interfering with management and makes it clear where the credit and the blame should go. The problem, I think, with this approach is that firing management is extremely disagreeable and most directors will wait till things are very serious and maybe too late before they will do it. I might add to that point, I've been involved in firing of five presidents and CEOs. Um, and I must say all but GM are doing incredibly better. So we did the right thing. There are those on the other hand who are arguing for a more interventionist board, an approach that many think constituents Microman constitutes micromanaging companies. Um, I'm probably a little bit in this camp today after 20 plus years of serving on boards. You might remember a Wall Street Journal headline, move over CEO, here come the directors. Directors are mingling with employees to get the lowdown on, on uh, simmering problems. They're opening channels of communications with investors to hear their complaints. They're hiring their own advisors to double check management's decisions, and they're nominating new board members, which, golly, was a responsibility usually left to CEOs, imagine that. I also find myself, however, though a little bit of an interventionist, uh, agreeing with Chancellor William Allen of the Delaware Court of uh, Chancery, a leading scholar on corporate law, when he said that it is the duty of the board of directors to monitor management and to take an active role in the formulation of long-term strategic, financial, and organizational goals of the corporation, and that directors should approve plans to achieve these goals, should actually engage and take part in periodic short and long-term <coughs> performance reviews compared to those plans. And he says, be prepared to press for corrective action when there is need, and I would say, prepared to insist on corrective action when it is needed. Because the outside director's main contact with the company is the CEO, it's largely then through the CEO that outside directors exercise this oversight, overseeing and monitoring the progress of the CEO, bluntly hiring and firing the CEO based on rigorous measures of performance. But for the outside directors to do this requires governance reforms that have been put in place over these last really 20 years and, and very much currently. Hearing views outside of management is an integral part of being a good director. And now you may know they post on websites and the like contact information for directors, individually and collectively. It's not as effective, I don't think, for the director as walking the walk and talking the talk uh, within the company. Uh, but we read analyst reports. Uh, we read the media reports. We have access to customers. And we listen with belief, and I, I say that because it's an admonition I will give to you that I've learned through the Fannie Mae experience. My colleague, Ann Mulcahy, the chairman of uh, Xerox, was on the board with me. And we were lamenting what had happened and what did we miss. And uh, we concluded that you must listen with a different ear. She does it at Xerox. Instead of saying, oh yes, we already know that. Oh yeah, well, we've thought of that. Oh yeah, well he's always grouchy, or they always say that. You listen and say, well is there something there? Uh, and it doesn't have to be a formal whistleblower, it could be as in the case of what I just shared with you about Fannie Mae, a reputational issue. That it's not just someone's angst that's being critical. So it's a good lesson, I think. Um, but this is all a process, it's not a 
quick and easy way of functioning as a director. It's a process throughout the years that you participate. We're probably also in governance never going to reach a final stage of corporate governance. I said if, if corporate governance was uh, a cottage industry, as I used to think it was, it's about ready to be an IPO because it's taken on such a life. But truly, increased director independence will not prevent future misconduct or managerial problems. And it's not a substitute for other criti critical qualities like experience, knowledge, diligence, and the common sense and integrity. However, corporate governance processes will hopefully allow directors uh, to achieve some semblance of oversight that perhaps has been missing in some companies. So if you look at what our legal responsibilities are, I believe one of the primary prerequisites for director performance has to be this complete independence. This means independence from management and the CEO, independence from the company in order to be an objective outsider, independence from any kind of action or influence. And this independence may be compromised, for example, by treating directors as employees, offering them similar benefits intended to link the employee on a career basis with the company. That can be some compensation issues and the like that now really are not in vogue and no longer acceptable. Independence can be also compromised through the retention of directors for professional services of various kinds or through major business dealings with them as suppliers, financiers, or customers, creating a conflict of interest. Again, disclosure in the proxy is uh, more required today than it used to be on those kinds of issues. So you might say, what qualities contribute to director independence? And, and for a strong effective board, I would suggest character, strategic insight, business knowledge, judgment, experience, and time whether you have the time to serve, and confidence, and that confidence is demonstrated in your ability to ask the tough questions. Um, I also think diversity contributes to independence, and I don't mean just um, gender or race or ethnicity uh, diversity, but professional and educational backgrounds, geography, industry. Almost all the boards I'm on now are a, really a wonderful collegial collection of terrific backgrounds of independent thinkers coming together for one common purpose. And there's no doubt that boards are richer when there's more representation and everyone isn't of that same club. I went on my first board uh, when I was about 33, National Savings and Trust Company board, a bank board in Washington, DC. It was the old boys club and they paid us, they had a little brown envelope next to your seat and they paid us in coins, gold coins. Those days are over. Um, so I can't understate the need for collegiality, the need for this kind of diversity, the need for this kind of independence, and the operative word there is collegiality. You cannot bring a board to some conclusion if you don't respect and get along with one another, even if uh, you have disagreements. As independent board members, we will continue to see directors taking more active roles, demanding better information about the critical corporate decisions they must make this independence will put more of a demand on the company to get better and better and more relevant materials, information, and data to the board. And that all helps in evaluating the CEO more explicitly and more rigorously, and more often will flow from this independence as well. And while becoming more independent of their CEOs and of CEO orchestrated information, outside directors are taking a more aggressive role in succession planning and in director sele uh, selection and then evalu <coughs> evaluating their own performance. Let me, as an aside, say at General Motors, just to give you an idea of that culture in 1990, I was on the GM board with Bill Marriott. Now, we both came from Washington for the board meetings to either New York or Detroit. <clears throat> and it was all right for us to fly together on the GM Air Force, but when we got off the plane, we were in separate cars. It made no sense, except there was this management of the board to keep the board separate from one another. And those days are gone, but that was the old way of a CEO dominating a board in many, many little ways just to make it more difficult aside from information for you to have a collective uh, wisdom. So what do we do? How do we do this? We create an organizational and an operational framework uh, in order to uh, help evaluate performance, evaluate the CEO, and conduct our fiduciary responsibilities. And it has to be a framework that is reliable and and a sensible governance process. 
you know, it takes, it really does take courage to exercise good governance and follow through on the tough decisions when there are so many interpersonal relationships at stake. So we need a system, of course, of leadership of a chair, and there's a lot of pressure today for a non-executive chairman, I'll come back to that, CEO, a lead director, someone who can coordinate the board in executive sessions and, and uh, communicate with the CEO in a way that is helpful. And there are different leaderships at different times because the role and duty of each director to communicate with and provide counsel to as appropriate, uh, the CEO is an individual expression of how they see their job. But guidelines and structural solutions alone don't help boards become more effective in their primary purpose of ensuring the long-term health of the enterprise. Um, but these roles need to be uh, clarified and the roles and responsibilities laid out. I happen to be somewhat process-oriented and I've never, I've never seen a board dynamic fail when you have a process that you can follow everyone understands the process, then there's room for everyone to express their views and to gain information they needed. But at the bottom line, the director, director must be willing to take risks, not just to protect shareholder wealth, but guide management to take risks also that will grow shareholder investment. And clearly, Sarbanes-Oxley and other measures have created fear of taking risk and making risk-taking harder. Um, some say that Sox, Sarbanes-Oxley, was poorly conceived, hastily inactive, and has created a climate of fear. My husband, who is here, I'm happy to say, uh, has had 40-some years in Washington, D.C., and is known as the 101st Senator. He says quite clearly, and we see it today in corporate governance and other issues, Congress, he says, <coughs> does, <coughs> excuse me, does two things well, nothing and overreact. <laughs> I think there's some who feel they're doing both at once right now. So, <clears throat> Another thing directors need is grace under pressure. In today's regulatory environment, it's likely that your company or your organization will face an issue at a board level at some point uh, related to accounting disclosure, compliance, an ethics breach, or something else. And what distinguishes companies is how the directors and managers respond to that. And it seems to me the director's first job is to keep a level head and give management the opportunity to take appropriate action. And if management fails to act, then directors should take the action and act decisively and hold management accountable. So today, boards must navigate not only a domestic environment, but a very difficult business environment with intense competition from foreign manufacturers. There's weak consumer confidence, unemployment, volatile financial markets, all while undergoing public and political scrutiny like never before. Second guessing of corporate decisions has generated a number of corporate governance proposals, and I think they're trying to shift the decision making from boards to institutional shareholders and shareholder activists, which only is gonna create short-term thinking. So we're really in a schizophrenic governance period here. I think it can uh, hurt the board's ability uh, to resist that short-term gain as, only, as their only focus. And let me say that as boards function today, certainly after Sarbanes-Oxley, and it was true after Enron uh, generally, uh, and continues to be true, boards are just now uh, getting back to being boards and away from the over-compliance mentality and the checklist mentality. And most of the boards I'm on kept their heads pretty high and cool uh, so we were mindful of our strategic planning obligations and all our other obligations, but it's pretty hard when corporate lawyers and outside counsel are briefing you on all the things that could happen to you. Uh, Shareholder Rights Act, uh, Act of 2009 cites widespread failure of corporate governance as one of the, quote, central causes of the financial and economic crisis that the U.S. faces today and would enhance the ability of shareholders to override boards of directors and compel companies to manage for the short term. And I think that's just a criminal uh, statement, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm not on the board of Citibank or AIG or any of those. Uh, and uh, I would say that the cause is more about uh, politics, um, policy, process, and people in those individual companies. But policy at the federal and 
level was a big uh, influence and products that were created in the financial services industry responded. So we can all debate that, but I would step back from that fairly harsh statement, uh, to be honest with you. A consensus among many directors, however, uh, in a recent study, is that maybe the key to improving performance at the board level is not government action, but rather action on the port part of each board. So I think boards are looking at themselves and saying, okay, what can we do better? How directors work together and how they work with management to oversee the company could not effectively be regulated by government. Not a one-size-fits-all either. Each board should develop a structure, a process, and practices tailored for the company's needs. For example, I'm on five boards right now. Two have non-executive directors, excuse me, non-executive chairmen uh, overseeing the directors. That works for two of the boards. Three of my boards, it's chairman and CEO with a lead director. Um, and I'd be hard pressed to want to have them insist on a non-executive chairman at a governmental level to run a company that we know more about. So I think that's one issue that you'll see more of. There are a few other issues, and then I'll wind up here, uh, that I'd like to just highlight for what I see in 2010. Obviously, executive compensation is number one. Um, it's, it's not just pay for performance, but the practice has been pay without performance, and that's what I think has so many of us outraged. So a strong board needs executive compensation practices that are not only really pay for performance, but are, are uh, explained with full transparency. And CEOs should be subject to the same rules of risk and rewards as everyone else. Set forth publicly the metrics and methodology that the board used to determine the compensation, describe the process, and then stay with the program. Uh, as many of you know, since 2007, the SEC has required a CDNA, compensation discussion and analysis, a part of the proxy. Uh, the shareholders in the SEC want to know how a company's programs work why they work in that manner. But if that wasn't enough, uh, and we're doing that, I might add, uh, world leaders in September, uh, this past September at the G20 summit in London, agreed in principle to reform executive compensation standards with the goal of reducing excessive risk seeking. A declaration issued after the summit endorsed a set of compensation principles for significant financial institutions developed to ensure compensation structures are consistent with the firm's long-term goals and prudent risk-taking. So now we have the economic summit of the world getting involved in how boards uh, should manage their compensation issues. Many of the financial institutions or the bank pay practices that have been targeted um, have been somewhat in the area of those financial institutions that received government money in the bailout. But those practices are starting to impact the practices of all public companies, and that's a work in progress. Now, there are several pieces of legislation uh, in the congressional pipeline, and I might add, you probably read the Bank of America is having a little trouble landing a CEO. Um, the PAYSAR uh, has told Goldman how to, how to handle their payout. City is about, Citibank's about ready to pay its money back, 20 billion or so, so it can be free of the government influence. But just to give you an idea of what's on Capitol Hill, it's always fun to see these in the aggregate. Here are some of the uh, legislative initiatives. The, the names alone are pretty good. Shareholder Bill of Rights Act, 2009. Shareholder Empowerment Act of 2009. The Investor Protection Act of 2009. The Corporate and Financial Institution Compensation Fairness Act of 2009 the Corporate Governance Reform Act of 2009, the Excessive Pay Shareholder Approval Act of 2009, and Restoring American Financial Stability Act of 2009. Don't you, you don't think there's a little trouble coming from all of that activity? Um, boy, I do. Uh, this would require, in many, these would require in many cases a non-binding say on pay vote on executive compensation and cold, golden parachutes with an approval of 60% of shareholders where a comp package is in excess of 100 times the average comp uh, of uh, employees. Also require mandatory, uh, mandatory clawback provision restrictions on severance and uh, disclosure on the use of compensation consultants and their independence. So you get, you get the drift. I, I, by the way, I'm a big supporter of clawback uh, if there's some egregious behavior uh, uh, that occurred on someone's watch, then I think the, the, the economic benefit should be returned. 
and my husband's telling me I'm talking too long, so that's why you're here. <laughs> uh, quickly, I'll just say what the others are, and you can ask me questions about it. Uh, other issues for 2010, succession planning. Uh, clearly, uh, evaluation of the CEO, evaluation of the board, planning for succession of the board and the CEO, incredibly important. Risk management. Every board meeting I've been to in the past week, we started with a new ERM, Enterprise Risk Management. Chart, list, discussion, which board committee is needed to oversee it if necessary, how it's structured in the company. Long-term value versus short-term gain, I really touched on that. That's going to continue to be an issue. A board structure, eliminating classified boards, which is, I'm on a couple where we are elected every three years instead of one year. Enhanced disclosures of the leadership structure and the director's skills, what, what we bring to it. Director elections, majority voting. Uh, a lot of these are going to be an invitation for hostile takeovers that are going to be a lot less hostile and very clever through these majority voting and, and proxy access. Another one to allow share owners share owners to nominate board members a little more easily, um, separating the chair and CEO, which I mentioned. So um, there's lots to talk about. I hope I've stimulated your thinking a little bit, and I hope you have some, uh, some questions. But more importantly, I hope you have some observations that might inform me as well. I know this is a, a dialogue and a two-way street. I wish we could sit here for the morning and discuss these issues. But we have a few minutes for questions. And I would just close by saying before, Others fix things for us through public outrage and new government mandates. Uh, boards and corporate leadership have to start fixing things themselves. Thank you very much. Appreciate being here. Thank you.